Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our patient management series. In this video, we're going to talk about behavior change. What is it? Three models of behavior change. And finally, three major types of behavioral learning. So health behavior involves a complex interplay of a person's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So the way someone behaves is based on multiple motivating factors. And changing that behavior is as easy as ABC. And the ABC model is a tool that can help people examine behaviors they want to change, the triggers behind those behaviors, and the impact of those behaviors on positive or negative patterns. So the A stands for antecedent. That's the factor that facilitates the behavior. B stands for the behavior itself. And finally, C stands for consequences, or the consequences of that behavior. So for an example, antecedent could be food that's caught in between your teeth. And the behavior that this causes is flossing in order to remove the food from your teeth. And the positive consequence of that is relief, because food is no longer caught between your teeth. So this is an example of how an antecedent of food can cause a behavior change of you wanting to floss. Now in a bigger picture, the stages of change are really important to know for the board exam. So let's spend some time unpacking these five steps. I'm going to talk through the five stages first and then give you an example of how this applies to someone trying to quit smoking. So pre-contemplation is when you're not considering any behavior change. Contemplation is when you begin to consider behavior change. Preparation is when you actually start to prepare to take steps to change, and you're often on board and express a desire to change. Action is when you're taking some sort of practical actions towards that behavior change. It often requires support from other individuals. And finally, maintenance is once the behavior has been changed, you attempt to maintain that changed behavior. So pre-contemplation, let's say the patient is unaware or unwilling to stop smoking. And as the clinician, you should ask about their feelings towards smoking, ask about the pros and the possible cons of smoking. And your job here is to bring awareness to the situation. And we're not trying to get them from step one to five in one day. It's baby steps, and you go through each stage at a time. So contemplation is where the patient is now thinking about quitting smoking. And we should reinforce their reasons for change and explore new pros and cons. Preparation, sometimes also called determination, is say the patient is getting ready to stop smoking, and they're most likely on board and now we should get practical. We should pick a stop date. We should be talking about identifying possible barriers to quitting smoking and things like that. In the action stage, the patient has now quit smoking and is actively applying cessation skills. So we should help them stay off tobacco products and help them to recover from relapse. And finally, maintenance where the patient is now integrating smoke-free living on a day-to-day -day basis. So we should, again, encourage and praise this successful behavior change. All right, next we have social cognitive theory. And this is another model to, stu to study behavior change. And there are three important tenets of this theory. So social cognitive theory is influenced by these three factors. Self-efficacy is the main tenet, and it refers to the cognitive perception that you can execute behaviors necessary for a given situation. So what does that mean? Basically, positive affirmation, telling yourself you can do something. And patients are less motivated when goals seem too big or even impossible to achieve. So instead, focus on short-term achievable goals with them so they can affirm for themselves that, oh, this is something that I can handle, this is something that I can do. Behavioral modeling means that you learn proper behavior from role models in the society around you. 
And finally, social reinforcement comes into play when that behavior yields positive social consequences. So this theory is a combination of cognitive factors that are internal and the social environment, which is external, hence the name social cognitive theory. And lastly, we have the health belief model, which is yet another model to study behavior change. And it's our last one to cover in the video. So this one has to do more with one's own perceived susceptibility to disease. So according to this, to this model, if they believe they're at risk of getting cavities, they're more apt to do something about it. If they think they'll never get cavities because, well, none of their friends brush their teeth and they never get cavities, why should they? So this has to do with your perception or belief of your own health or lack thereof. There's also a inherent cost-benefit analysis. So you judge severity of consequences of your actions based on how risky or how beneficial they may be. So it's a very practical approach. And similar to some of the other factors we were talking about before, cues to action are prompts to engage or not engage in a certain behavior based on cues or social interactions with others. So the main thing here though, is that if a patient believes they are susceptible to problems, they are more likely to engage in good preventative oral health care. And this goes back to the health belief model and hence the name. So now let's talk about three major types of behavioral learning. We have classical conditioning, where a whistle is blown and the dog is now ready for food. Operant conditioning, where the rat voluntarily pulls a lever and food comes out as a result. And observational learning, where the young boy follows what his dad is doing. So classical is based on stimuli or stimulus, Operant is based on consequences, and observational learning is based on modeling. And so I'll bring up those three terms as we talk about each of these three types of behavioral learning in more detail. So classical conditioning is all about stimuli, and this one was studied at length with Pavlov's dogs, which is an important concept in psychology. So first, we start with the unconditioned stimulus, or US. In this case, it's the food. And without any experimental influence, that food triggers an unconditioned reaction, or UR, which is, in this case, the dog salivating, thinking and smelling the food. So outside of any experiment, US causes UR. Now, we add in a neutral stimulus, or NS. So, in this case, it's ringing a bell. And there's no unconditioned reaction in this case. The dog doesn't respond to the bell by itself. But, now we add in, and so there's no response. And now we add in the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. And after many pairings, where the bell is rung every time food is offered, we're getting this uh, initially unconditioned reaction. The dog is now pairing that unconditioned reaction with the addition of the neutral stimulus. So after many times of this occurring, the conditioned stimulus, CS, which was originally the neutral stimulus, now elicits a conditioned response, or CR, which is originally the unconditioned reaction. So without any food or unconditioned stimulus, the bell now triggers the salivation. So an example in dentistry would be, let's say the dentist gives injections, which are the unconditioned stimulus, that are painful and cause anxiety, which is the unconditioned reaction. So those two things have a cause and effect relationship. The neutral stimulus, in this case, the bell, would be the presence of a dentist, usually wearing a white coat to give said injection. So once this is repeated multiple, multiple times, 
the mere presence of the dentist, particularly in a white coat, will cause anxiety for the patient, known as white coat syndrome. Now, there is hope though. Classical extinction can occur if the link between the stimulus and the reaction is discontinued. So, for example, you could have a different dentist or have an appointment without any injections and etc. There are multiple things that can happen and it's possible to break to break this link. So it's really interesting and certainly applicable in dentistry considering classical conditioning and how it can work in the mind of the patient. All right, next we have operant conditioning, which is all about consequences. And so these are also really important to learn, especially in terms of child psychology. So positive reinforcement means you do a good thing and you get rewarded for it. So behaving during your appointment really well means you get a prize at the end of it, or brushing every day or brushing really well and then coming to the dentist and having healthy teeth means you get a sticker at the end of the appointment. Negative reinforcement means you do a good thing and we remove a bad stimulus as a result. So behaving well means the appointment will be done faster so you can get out of the dentist's office a little bit earlier. Brushing really well means you won't get cavities and have toothaches and have to get shots and have them filled. So that's an example. All those are examples of negative reinforcement. Now we go to the other side of the coin. Positive punishment means you do a bad thing and you get punished for it. It's also called aversive conditioning. So every time you don't brush your teeth or you forget to do so, you have to clean your room. Or let's say behavi- behaving poorly at the dental appointment means you might have to be restrained during the cleaning. And finally, we have negative punishment, which means, again, you do a bad thing. This time we remove a good stimulus. So behaving poorly during the appointment means we have to take your phone away. And there are multiple examples I'm sure you can come up with. Now, reinforcement is preferred over punishment when possible, but if the patient is consistently acting badly, then punishment may be your only option to some degree. Now, of course, we also have operant extinction. So this can occur if a link between the behavior and the reward or punishment is discontinued, and there's some inconsistency among doing a good thing and getting rewarded for it or doing a bad thing and getting punished for it. So operant extinction can either be helpful or harmful depending on the goals you're trying to employ. And lastly, we have observational learning, which is all about modeling. So observational learning or behavior modeling refers to the acquisition of a skill by observing someone else doing it. So a great example of this, and it does come up on the board exam, asking an anxious or uncooperative child to observe his or her cooperative sibling is a great strategy when it's applicable. If you have one kid who's not behaving well and there's an open operatory and they can witness their sister or brother who is behaving really well and having a much better time, that's a great example of possibility where you can employ observational learning for them. All right, now let's talk about some more practical behavioral strategies, things you can employ in and out of the office. So we can change the antecedent. This is going back to the ABC model. We just uh, talked about the beginning of the video. So we could place floss on the nightstand as a daily reminder for us to be flossing. That would be an example of changing the antecedent. We can also change the consequences. So Let's say not only does it feel better after you floss and you remove food from in between your teeth, but if you do floss, you reward yourself with 10 minutes of video game time or reading time or something like that. So you can reward yourself and even add to positive consequences of flossing. Shaping means you set small attainable goals and reward yourself after each step. 
So if you study for the board exam for the next hour, maybe you reward yourself with 15 minutes of watching TV or playing video games or something that you really look forward to. The pre-MAC principle means that you make a behavior that has a higher probability of being performed contingent on a behavior that has a lower probability of being performed. So this is probably best explained with an example. So let's say we tell a child that we'll only read a bedtime story for them if they floss. So the lower probability activity is, of course, flossing, and the higher probability activity is reading a bedtime story, which let's say you do most every night. So you incentivize flossing with a bedtime story, something they enjoy, something that you know will probably happen. The flossing, maybe not so much. And finally, the ability to change depends on the locus of control, whether your motivation is internal or external. So internal motivation, if it is internal, essentially you're more successful at behavior change. So this would be saying like, I did poorly on the exam because I didn't study. That was on me. Whereas external motivation, you're typically less successful at influencing behavior change because you might say, I did poorly on the exam because that exam was unfair and you're pointing your finger outwards and blaming other things. So that's an example of internal versus external loci of control. All right, and the last thing I wanna to touch on is a really crucial topic in the realm of health behavior change, and this is motivational interviewing. You may have heard of it, and it's a very practical means of how to apply health behavior change in the dental clinic. Now, it's, it's more like counseling than interviewing, so it's not the best term, but it is well known as motivational interviewing. So it's a person-centered counseling style to assist in the resolution from ambi ambivalence to change. Most people start out at ambivalence, not caring about something, and this is a normal part of the change process, like we talked about the pre-contemplation stage and moving them towards a stage of change. So it revolves around the ORS model, as if I needed any more acronyms to introduce for you. But I will say this one is so critical because I got a question asking literally which of the following is not a component of the ORS model. And so you just have to remember what each of the letters stands for. And that's open questions, affirmations, reflective listening, and summarizing. A lot of this overlaps with things we've talked about in the previous two videos and also this one. So for motivational interviewing, there are four important steps to take in order. And they are engaging, focusing, evoking, and planning. So what does this all mean? Well, engaging means we're forming a genuine relationship with the patient, right? We're using rapport, we're establishing rapport with the patient, we're actively listening, and applying empathy when appropriate. Focusing is where we're exploring the motivation, the goals, and the values of that person. So we're exploring generally what motivates them, what are their goals in life, and what do they value. Then we move to evoking. So this is eliciting or drawing out their own specific motivations for X behavior, smoking, drinking, not flossing, whatever it may be. And so we would discuss the disadvantages of remaining in their current behavior pattern and discussing advantages of changing that behavior pattern. And once we get through that step, we can move to planning, exploring how one might move toward change. And so it's important to be actively listening to see where the patient would be at at this fourth phase. So we can listen for sustained talk, which means they're not ready to change. The patient's communication favors them staying right where they're at at this point in time. We can listen for change talk, which means their communications favoring movement towards change, or commitment talk, where we're, we're hearing that the patient is expressing readiness and willingness to change, 
So these are all things, again, you can be actively listening for during your counseling session. All right, and that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I know there's a lot of information here, a lot of acronyms, but I will say a lot of the things we talked about are overlapping with one another. They're, it does boil down to a lot of common sense. There are some things that you do have to commit to memory, like the stages of change and the ORS model, but I think a lot of it will overlap as you go through it and study it, and so it's not maybe as overwhelming as it may seem at the initial step. So stay with it, reward yourself as you study, and um, keep on going. You guys are great. So if you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out my Patreon page. I have a huge thank you to Michael Raja, Eins Lau, David Jaden, Yana, and all my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.